Hello, Andrew, Murder in the UK. Today we're looking at the case of Dr. Harold Shipman, also known as Dr. Death. Harold Shipman killed at least 300 of his patients between 1971 and 1999, some for financial gain, some for unknown reasons. To learn more about this case, visit www.murderuk.com or how about leaving a comment below and let's have a discussion about this case or stay tuned for a documentary about this case. Thank you. I have here a photograph of Lily Crossley. If you'd like to look at that, just for the benefit of the tape, Dr Shipman's eyes are closed and he didn't look at the photograph at all. Harold Shipman is Britain's most prolific serial killer. A well-respected doctor, he abused his position of trust, poisoning over 250 patients. I've been advised to stand and let you take a photograph and then go away. If a bomb had gone off, there wouldn't be as many victims. To start off with, we were investigating one death. Within a couple of weeks, that grew to 62 deaths. We had a whiteboard there with no names on, and at the end of the inquiry, the whiteboard was totally full. And it was like, oh, my God. On the 20th anniversary of Shipman's arrest, this film, with new witness testimony, tells the inside story of how he got away with murder for nearly three decades. They thought it was obscene that we should be questioning anything to do with Shipman. A serial killer hiding in plain sight, Shipman groomed a community. People to this day still think that he was the best doctor ever. And preyed on the most vulnerable. I just thought, oh my goodness, you know, maybe he killed my mum as well. Into a house, rolled the sleeve up, administered morphine, killed her and you're covering up what you were doing. People do die suddenly, of old age. They just wear out. We expose the scale of Shipman's drug addiction that nearly saw him struck off the medical register. The chairman says he doesn't think he's a danger to the public, so he's not going to strike him off. And a nurse, in her first interview, reveals how his killing spree began as a junior doctor on the hospital wards. One night, we had three deaths. We just went from room to room and the patient had died. For the first time, detectives at the heart of the case explain the tactics they used to bring the man they called Dr. Death to justice and the emotional toll it had on them. I can remember sat at home one night with the wife and I just broke down in tears. I'm just sick of all this death and destruction. On the 7th of September, 1998, Harold Shipman, a trusted family doctor from the small town of Hyde near Manchester, was arrested for the murder of one of his elderly patients. Waiting to interview Shipman were two young detectives, John Walker and Mark Denham. This is the first time that Mark Denham has spoken publicly about coming face to face with Britain's most infamous killer. For me at that time, it was quite a, a big thing because I was a, a fairly young detective. I'd only been a detective less than a couple of years. And to be chosen to do the interviews was, um, it was great for me. I can picture the room. I can remember where I was sitting and John was at the side and then uh, his legal representative and he was there. The time presently is 1.33 p.m. on Monday the 7th of September 1998. With the first of the tape, could you tell me full name, please? Harold Frederick Shipman. He wasn't a scary person or anything like that. It was just his arrogance sort of, huh, sort of pushing me aside a little bit, you know. And perhaps I've made clear what ha happened when Mrs Grundy asked me to witness the will. Britain's biggest ever murder inquiry started six weeks earlier with a phone call about a fraud. 
I got a telephone call telling me about the fact that there had been some suspicions around a will uh, which had been written for a woman called Kathleen Grundy. Kathleen Grundy was a former mayor of Hyde. She had died a month earlier. Her will set alarm bells ringing in the mind of her daughter, Angela Woodruff, a solicitor. Angela Woodruff was really concerned that there was something not right about the circumstances surrounding this will, about how it had turned up. She didn't think that it was her mother's wishes at all and she wanted it investigated. One of the things that's talked about in the will is about leaving my house to my doctor. Well, Kathleen Grundy actually owned two properties, so if she was writing her own will, she would have been talking about leaving my two houses, which indicated that it hadn't been written by Kathleen Grundy. The doctor named in the will was Kathleen Grundy's GP, Harold Frederick Shipman. I sent officers to get search warrants for Dr. Shipman's surgery. Dr. Shipman used to conduct a surgery on a Saturday morning and we waited till he was locking up and then went to execute the warrant. The search of Shipman's surgery would blow the case wide open. When they started the search, Dr. Shipman said, you'll need this. Mrs. Grundy used to borrow it from time to time, and that was the typewriter. The typewriter was examined along with the will by the handwriting experts, and they were able to say that that typewriter has typed that will. One of the keys didn't give the right impression, which is really a godsend in a, an inquiry where you're wanting to gather forensic evidence to show that that typewriter made that document. We'll move on to Mrs. Grundy's will. That will, the forensic will, examined and found to be a forgery. Do you have any comments to make about that? No, I've got no comment to make. He's asked a number of direct questions about it, which he deals with very simply and straightforwardly, just by saying no. The letters in the will were all typed on your typewriter. Can you account for that? No. He was quite comfortable in his own mind that he could tough it out simply by denying everything. This is the typewriter that's kept in your surgery. This is a typewriter that was loaned out to Mrs Grundy on two or three occasions. You allege that Mrs Grundy borrowed the typewriter on two or three occasions. We're talking here about a lady who was 81. You would imagine they have some difficulty in pumping a typewriter about high, but I'm asking who could have used your typewriter to type that letter. No answer in that I don't know. This was a very strange story that was being told. And if it was true, it was likely that somebody was going to benefit from the forged will. And one of the uh, possibilities was that Mrs Grundy had been murdered. Can I put it directly to you, Doctor, that you forged this will from your own typewriter in the hope of benefiting from Mrs Grundy's estate? Is that a question or a statement? I put it to you that that's the case. That is not the case. Dr Shipman had also signed Kathleen Grundy's death certificate. He stated she died of natural causes. Would you agree that there's no medical history which would support Mrs. Grundy's very sudden death? People do die suddenly, of old age. They just wear out. Despite the fact that Kathleen Grundy was an elderly woman, she was in fine physical shape. She'd been uh, out walking in the uh, Peak District only a day or two before she died. So the way that we were going to establish whether Kathleen Grundy had died of natural causes was to exhume the body and have tests carried out by the pathologist. The exhumation of Kathleen Grundy would be the first ever carried out by Greater Manchester Police. With no witnesses, crime scene or murder weapon, it was the only way they could prove she'd been murdered.
were at uh, Hyde Chapel, which is where uh, Kathleen Grundy was buried. This is the cemetery where the first exhumation took place. The weather was not really good at all. It was up past three in the morning. It was raining like this. And you could see the, the moon filtering through the clouds that were passing over through the trees. You do the best with tents and all that sort of thing to cover what you're doing. But the noise, you can't do it quite, really, unfortunately. I can remember the, the old folks home there. There was old people at the windows crying. It wasn't nice at all. Something that I'm never going to forget that. It was horrendous. The police investigation was about to come under pressure. A local newspaper received a tip-off linking Shipman to Kathleen Grundy's death and the suspicion there could be many more. I came into town and I um, started to ask people if they knew anything about the case. And almost straight away I bumped into two old ladies and they said, oh, you mean Dr. Death, dear? And I said, pardon? And they said, oh, lots of old ladies have died with him. They say he's a good doctor, but you don't last. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I thought I was investigating one death. And it turned out that people in the town had been calling him Dr. Death as a joke for two years, because lots of elderly people had died usually with him present. Sometime on the morning of, I think it was the 17th of August, I got a phone call from the press office saying that they'd had an inquiry from the Manchester Evening News and that from the detail that they were relating, they had pretty much the whole story. Michaela identified other female patients of Shipman whose deaths were suspicious. The police, understandably, were not happy that we'd um, uncovered this story quite quickly. At the same time, because it appeared in the Manchester Evening News, dozens and dozens of families in town came forward to say that is exactly what happened to my mother. Michaela's front page story became national news. TV crews descended on Dr. Shipman's surgery. And I'm sure you've had enough time to take a decent photograph. Been, uh, is, is it possible for you just to Thank say you. anything at all? back into surgery to do my surgery. But you have said you have no Anxious to families it. demanded answers from the police. It left us in a, a bit of a difficult situation. Thank you, Doctor. It was unfair to expect those family members to speculate for a period of time and for them to hear from the press about which deaths happened to be on this list. So I had to send officers out to see those families. Within a matter of days, the police were overwhelmed as new victims emerged. I think there was something like three or four on one street that had died, and that we went back to investigate his potential murders. It beggared belief, it really did. Well, we're just coming into Hyde now, into the town centre. It's a working-class town, population probably around about 
35, 40,000 people on the outskirts of, uh, of Manchester. This is where Dr Shipman's victims lived, worked, uh, and many of them had grown up uh, here as well. 20 years ago, the revelation that a local GP, Harold Shipman, could be killing his elderly patients shocked the nation. The people of Hyde were beginning to ask questions that no one should ever have to ask. I must have been watching television and I just heard a Dr Shipman and I wasn't at that time really familiar but it kind of rang a bell. So I rang Jean and said, wasn't that my mother's doctor? I just thought, oh my goodness, you know, maybe he killed my mum as well. Perhaps I should have a word with the police when I get home. But I was no sooner back than the police contacted me. Well, I mean, things were different then. You didn't just snap everything on your phone. Well, you took pictures when you were on your holidays, and then you'd only take pictures of your mum and dad when you got back, just to use the end of the film up, really. She was bubbly, sociable, outgoing, liked talking to people. She believed that you should smile at everybody that was walking along the street, as she did. Unfailingly positive, definitely, yeah. We'd look on the bright side of things all the time. When the detectives were questioning me, they would ask me various questions, and every time I answered, they would look at each other and nod, and they would say to me, yeah, yeah, and, you know, yes, it's... It followed exactly the same pattern as all the other ones, so that was when I thought, well, yes. As these early inquiries started, we perhaps thought Kathleen Grundy and perhaps one or two others, we couldn't have envisaged how it would all turn out, really. To start off with, we were obviously investigating one death the death of Kathleen Grundy. Within a couple of weeks, that grew to 17 deaths. And again, within a very short period of time, it had grown to 62 deaths. We had a whiteboard there with no names on, and at the end of the inquiry, the whiteboard was totally full. We couldn't fit any more on, we had to put extensions on. And it was like, oh my God. I personally had never worked on anything like that before in my life. I'd worked on lots and lots of murders, but nothing like Shipman had ever happened. You know, it was just, it was massive. I think there was something like three or four on one street that had died, and that we went back to investigate his potential murders. But it, it, was, it beggared belief, it really did. You'd speak to people and say, well, how did the doctor tell you about the death of your mother? And they say, well, actually, he, w he was actually quite abrupt. I was in bed, actually. My husband came and woke me up and said that Dr Shipman had been on the phone to him and that my mum had died. And I was, I was just in total disbelief. The word Shipman had actually used to my husband was, I'm at Irene Berry's house and uh, she's not very well. And he said, well, how bad is she? And he said, well, how bad can it get? The list of potential victims was growing by the day. The hard evidence of Shipman's murderous method was buried in the cemeteries of Hyde. In pitch darkness, a procession of police vehicles entered the cemetery at Hyde near Manchester. Just before 4 a.m., the time chosen for maximum sensitivity, the digging began. The area around the grave was screened off as detectives exhumed another body. The police had to exhume another 11 bodies. It was very, very moving, very sad knowing in your heart of heart, well, would I want my mother to be exhumed? And the answer is no, you wouldn't. 
we were digging the grave back up to do more tests on the mother that they've been grieving for for five years. So it was opening the wounds again. They would be grieving again, the same as they were the first time round. Back then, there was a very different attitude towards the medical profession. Few ever questioned their doctor. The people of Hyde were finding it hard to accept that their respected GP could be a murderer. Detectives were facing widespread resistance. Hey, missus, you all right? Which was getting in the way of their investigation. Hello, girls. You just think how many people thought we'd made it up, that oh, it yeah. was a pack of lies. But they thought the world of him. But why? His patients thought he was God's gift. We were met by some who were really aggressive. How dare we come and suggest something about Shipman? Because he was their doctor, they thought he'd done a fabulous job with their parent. They thought it was obscene that we should be questioning anything to do with Shipman. Nobody felt that they could speak against him. He, he was this well, invincible yeah. man who trusted. As we know ourselves from the reaction from people that we he, met. He obviously thought he was invincible. He was an arrogant bastard, without a doubt. People to this day still think that he was the, the best doctor ever. My colleague and I went to one house and we were physically frog-marched off the premises. You know, they weren't happy about us being there at all. Dr Shipman's surgery was on Market Street in the centre of Hyde. Previously, he'd been part of a group practice, but here, he was on his own with his patients, which was just the way he liked it. Shipman was really popular, and when he went single-handed, he took 3,000 patients with him, and there was a waiting list. He looked after a lot of families, a lot of different generations within those families, but the ones who really liked him were the older generation. He had a lot of time for them, he was happy to make home visits, and that was a big deal to that generation. Um, and they would tidy up before the doctor came and even buy him Christmas presents to say thank you for all that he did for them. But in fact, he was actually grooming the community and, and that's what makes it such a terrible betrayal. Four weeks after Kathleen Grundy's body had been exhumed, forensic tests revealed lethal levels of the painkiller, diamorphine. It was the evidence the police needed. I'm there to interview that bloke to the best of my abilities with what evidence I've got. But then the jigsaw comes together, doesn't it? The evidence was there, so as far as I'm concerned, that's enough. I'll quote forensic scientist who said to us that the, her death is consistent with the use or administration of a significant quantity of morphine or diamorphine, and some of the values have been seen in fatalities. Drowning under the weight of evidence, Shipman even tried to suggest that Kathleen Grundy had taken the lethal dose herself. I wondered very seriously whether this lady was taking drugs other than which I'd prescribed. It's seriously suggested that Mrs. Brundy, a well-respected lady, has inflicted fatal overdose upon herself. Is it, are you really suggesting that to us? No, I'm not suggesting Brundy. anything. I'm just telling you my fears and worries of this lady uh, at that time. When it came back that she got this massive diamorphine within the body, we knew that we were dealing with a murder. I suggest to you that you have injected Mrs. Grundy with a fatal overdose of morphine and brought about her death. No.
Britain's most prolific serial killer, Harold Shipman, started his career as a GP in the small Yorkshire market town of Todmorden in 1974. Shirley Horsfall was a close family friend of Shipman and his wife, Primrose. I grew up in that house and the Shipmans lived in the fourth semi-along. Fred and Primrose made a, a good couple who was very friendly, very caring. He used to come and see us if we were poorly at the house rather than have to go to the surgery. Everybody liked him. Good sense of humour. We'd share a laugh and a joke with everyone. He was very sociable. Everybody knew everyone else. We used to say had little get-togethers in each other's houses. A good friend and a good neighbour. They seemed a matched couple rather than the picture that's been painted of Fred being a completely dominant, sort of almost Victorian, you know, sort of do as I say. Certainly that is not the real picture of that family. Shirley, like everyone else, did not know that Shipman had already begun his killing spree. But he was careful choosing who to kill and who to care for. It was at uh, one of our sort of get-togethers of the family that Fred said, I don't think your mum's very well. And it did turn out that she was terminally ill. He picked up on my mum's illness and made sure she was looked after. He had perfect opportunity as her GP to kill her. And he didn't. You know, he obviously chose not to. He was very concerned about her and got her the, you know, the best treatment that he could, which again makes it hard to believe that he didn't look after other people's mums. But in 1975, Shipman nearly lost his job as a doctor. As his addiction to murder grew, so did another addiction, drugs. A local detective arrested him for forging prescriptions and illegal possession. This is the first time George McKeating has spoken on camera. I went to see Shipman, then there were track marks down both his arms. And I said, well, where were you using it? He says, well, just stress originally, but then I got, I got sort of got hooked on it and I, I was using more and more. We have obtained Shipman's original police statement. In it, he confesses he's an addict and says that he has no future intention to return to general practice. George McKeating went to give evidence to the doctor's governing body, the General Medical Council. He fully expected Shipman to be sacked. I was sat with my briefcase, waiting to be called, and this guy came through and he said, oh, it's finished. Just like that, I said, well, it's finished, he said, oh, it's finished. The chairman says he doesn't think he's a danger to the public, so he's not going to strike him off. I was a bit flabbergasted, to say the least. In my experience, addicts very rarely rehabilitate. And I thought, I'm going to hear about this guy again. Shipman was fined just 600 pounds and sent to rehab. The following summer in 1977, he reappeared 30 miles away in Hyde. He moved there with Primrose and their four children and quickly rebuilt his reputation as a trustworthy doctor. In 1982, his credibility beyond question, Shipman even appeared in an ITV documentary on mental illness. Both patients and local doctors like Fred Shipman. In the past, if a patient had got a mental illness that required admission to hospital, the patient was formally admitted, undressed, and placed in bed. Shipman's nerve is startling, given that he was already killing at will. And was treated as though they had a physical illness. Under the radar and above suspicion, a serial killer hiding in plain sight. It was this brash Dr. Shipman who showed up at Ashton Underline Police Station for his first interview with detectives over the death of Kathleen Grundy. And when he did, Chris Gleave of the Manchester Evening News was there at a distance with his camera. 
I'd had a tip off that Dr. Shipman was going to be arriving at Ashton Police Station. He stood outside the police station for about five or ten minutes and then he, he proceeded to walk the terrace streets behind the police station. And I was at the end of every street with a long lens photographing him with his solicitor. Eventually he saw me and walked over to me quite quickly over the road and said, is that what you want? Is that what you want? And uh, he just gave me an awful look. His solicitor led him away and then went into the police station. They were the last photographs of him. Shipman was convinced he could get away with murder. He had killed his patients when they were alone, and as a doctor, there was nothing he couldn't explain away. But it was this arrogance that the police planned to use against him. When he turned up at the police station, I'd arranged for one of the detective inspectors to book him in at the custody office. He would then be handed over to more junior officers, a detective sergeant and a detective constable, who would conduct the interviews. I wanted to give the impression to him that we were pampering to his ego, then to wrong foot him. This man does not want to be spoken to by a DC and a DS. He wants the top man there, Mr. Possels, interviewing him, and he's not going to get it. Lured into a false sense of security, detectives then hit Shipman with hard evidence. An examination of his computer revealed he had tampered with the medical records of patient Winifred Meller, creating a false history of heart disease to cover up her murder. You attended the house at three o'clock, and that's when you murdered this lady. You went back to the surgery and immediately started altering this lady's medical records. And we can prove that only minutes after three o'clock on that date, you were fabricating that false medical history for this woman. You tell me why you needed to do that. There's no answer. Well, there is. There's a very clear answer because you've been to a house, rolled the sleeve up, administered morphine, killed her, and you were covering up what you were doing. That's what happened, isn't it, Doctor? No. He thought he could control it, but when things got bad, he didn't control it, because he just shut up. He just went silent. It all became overwhelming for him, and he just stopped answering. Can we have a consultation at this stage, please? Certainly. The time now by my watch is 17, 12 hours, and we'll switch off the tape. He couldn't cope with it. His mind couldn't cope with it. And when he was taken back to the cell, he broke down. He pretty much collapsed. Shipman was cornered, but his breakdown meant the police had to stop questioning him. They called in one of Britain's leading forensic psychiatrists. I was in Wakefield, for a short journey across the Pennines to Manchester. Manchester police phoned me because they were puzzled by the behaviour and what it meant. Well, I was taken down to a room where he was and we sat down together. I started, as I often do, by asking how he wished to be addressed, and he said, call me Fred. Bit of a Pandora moment, really. I haven't opened this box for 15 years. It's, uh, it's the, um, it's my report on Dr. Shipman. I recall there was a distinct air of tension and presence about him, mostly coming from a sense of suppressed paranoid hostility. He sort of radiated this sense of hostility. But there was no remorse, really, for what he'd done. He was kind of hollowed out as a man, that there was nothing inside. I was pretty convinced that he would never confess. Dr Badcock 
declared Shipman was mentally fit and the police could resume questioning, but Shipman refused to cooperate with the police in any way. Uh, I think we've already been through the uh, point of you refusing to give us your name and full date of birth. In a later interview, Shipman even turned his back on detectives. So if we can start off uh, just by <coughs> going through um, all the deaths, Dr. Shipman, and the first one I'd like to speak to you about is the death of a, a lady by the name of Lily Crossley. I have here a photograph of Lily Crossley, if you'd like to look at that. Just for the benefit of the tape, Dr. Shipman's eyes are closed and we didn't look at the photograph at all. But the police didn't require Shipman's cooperation. They had evidence to charge him with 15 counts of murder. Dr. Harold Shipman's trial began on the 11th of October, 1999. The 54-year-old GP arrived at court, hidden behind the blacked-out windows of a police van. Dr. Shipman is accused of murdering 15 women between 1995 and 1998. In the public gallery, his wife Primrose listened intently as the jury were told to rely only on the evidence and not to speculate. It was difficult sitting in court. That's all it was, was a bombardment of evidence against him, and he didn't, he didn't answer to it. Shirley Horsfall was sitting in a packed public gallery. A few feet away was court artist Priscilla Coleman. Harold Shipman always seemed annoyed with everyone else. He just looked very insulted that anyone would ever dream that he would be the type of person to do that. So he was angry and pretty fierce. In contrast to Primrose, who always seemed quite cheery, funnily enough. I was crumbling at court, let alone Primrose. I was upset because Fred was in court and been charged with all these atrocities. And, but she was much better, more composed than I was. I'm trying to sum her personality up. I mean, she was just a big, sort of bubbly, outgoing, nothing phased her and very robust. Primrose was never arrested by the police and knew nothing about her husband's secret life as a serial killer. I'd really love to think that she didn't know anything about it. I'd, and I, I probably believe that she didn't. The trial lasted 57 days. Shipman was found guilty of 15 murders, including Kathleen Grundy and Winifred Mellor. The police knew Shipman was responsible for many more. The day after his conviction, a public inquiry was launched in Manchester to uncover the true scale of his crimes. Shipman was moved between prisons and ended up at Wakefield. Ray Rowett was the head of operations there and has prison reports from the time. Well, the various statements from staff, from psychologists, from different people, he can be both condescending and arrogant, obnoxious, solitary, 
And the report further states that Mr Shipman is in total denial of his crime. For the first time, we can reveal that prison staff feared Shipman was attempting to carry on his killing spree behind bars. Staff thought that prisoners were going to him and he was holding clinics within the cell. We had two prisoners who took ill and ended up in intensive care unit. The inmates had overdosed on black market prescription drugs. It looked as though they had been talking to Shipman. We obviously then thought that he was probably changing his modus operandi and that he could probably have had a hand in those two going to intensive care. The two prisoners refused to cooperate in an internal investigation and Shipman refused to cooperate in the ongoing public inquiry. But the inquiry didn't need his help. It investigated the deaths of nearly 900 of Shipman's patients in Hyde and Todmorden and came to an astonishing conclusion. The way in which Shipman could kill, face the relatives and walk away unsuspected would have been dismissed as fanciful if it had been described in a work of fiction. The figure of 215 killings may not represent the true total. Shipman remained silent and has never revealed why he murdered so many people. But he still had one last killing to do before he was finished. He worked in a prison textile shop, and the textile shop obviously had remnants of cloth, and he was secreting remnants of which he made a noose. He was found kneeling on the pipe with a ligature around his neck facing outwards. He timed his suicide to best effect. Shipman told me on numerous occasions that when his pension was sorted out, he would kill himself. I distinctly remember him saying to me on one occasion, I'm a doctor, I know where to do it. His death before retirement age meant his wife received his full pension and a £100,000 lump sum. His whole purpose was to make sure that his wife was looked after financially. And that's, that's exactly what happened. So you talk about control, you can't have no more control than that. Shipman's suicide in January 2004 sparked more revelations about the number of people he had killed. The day after his suicide, there was an article in the newspaper. It was like a resume of Dr. Harold Shipman. And then I just thought, I work with him. I actually felt as if I'd just run into a brick wall. It just <sighs> floored me. The mention of Pontefract General Infirmary triggered a memory for Sandra Whitehead. She realized she had worked there with the newly qualified Dr. Shipman in 1972. He was always called Fred at the hospital, not Harold. And he was always in a hurry. His white coat was never buttoned up. And the speed that he went down the corridor, it was always flailing at the back of him like wings. And I can remember these injection packs many a time. He would just leave on the bedside locker. For 30 years, Sandra had been haunted by one particular night shift with Shipman. One night, we had three deaths. We just went from room to room, and the patient had died. Just didn't seem any reason. They were ill, but they didn't look on death's door. It just seemed a high proportion of deaths out of a 32-bedded ward. Just 18 years old, Sandra didn't report her concerns about the deaths, or Dr. Shipman. I think I was just too young, too naive. I didn't have the knowledge and experience to maybe turn around and see senior management and say, 
I'm not happy about this. The information that Sandra provided led the public inquiry to investigate Shipman's time at Pontefract General. It uncovered further victims. It's now the 20th anniversary of Harold Shipman's arrest. Most of the detectives who helped put him behind bars have retired, but the investigation still casts a long shadow. If you had to say which job uh, do you remember, I think we would all agree the one job that we think about the most is the Shipman job. It was quite unique to have this mass murdering doctor. I don't think anybody even now can fully appreciate how horrible this man was. I tend to put things in boxes, me, and shut the lid on them. That's certainly a massive box for me where we had to put the lid on. He's playing God, he was playing God with those lives. The relatives trusted Dr Shipman. They wouldn't have anything bad said about him. They trusted him, and that trust had been totally and utterly obliterated by this man. I wouldn't call a doctor by this man. You just think, what an awful, evil man. I can remember about nine months after he was convicted, sat at home one night with the wife, and I just broke down in tears. And Joyce said, what's the matter? I said, I'm just sick of all this death and destruction. When he comes up, and he comes up regular, my missus says, will we ever be free of this man? And I think the answer is no. Jean and Joan's mum, Irene Berry, was officially listed by the public inquiry as having been unlawfully killed by Shipman. At the time that she died, I mean, I was working abroad and bringing up my son. I didn't have as much time to spend with her as I would have now. It's just sad that I can't use this time that I've got now with her. It sort of runs as a parallel along the side of your life all the time. Every now and again, you know, you bump into it. And, you know, especially at times, talking about it like this, you can maybe go for months on end and just carry on with your life and then something happens and you bump into it again. Thank you for watching. Murder UK is a website dedicated to giving the facts about murders and serial killers within the UK. Please consider subscribing and press that bell icon to be notified when we update new videos. Thank you.